really dedicated people to our fundraising team uh, and our building team. Uh, we had an audit, uh, an audit done, as you know, those are expensive, but we were able to come up with the, the funding to do that through private donations. Uh, and we're going to use that audit as we apply for uh, a lot of uh, big federal grants that we're uh, waiting on. Uh, we'll spend the rest of the year on that same course, really laying track and planning and developing our vision uh, to bring the, uh, this 1926 theater back to life. Um, and I'm sure you all know that the global entertainment industry has been devastated by COVID-19. Recent news, uh, you know, from Topeka Civic Theater bears that out locally. And all the local venues have been impacted by the pandemic. Um, at the Jayhawk, uh, revenue from rentals and merchandise and concessions and ticket sales was about $40,000 last year. And we expect it to be well under 10,000 this year. And we're trying to anticipate the loss of our quarterly uh, TGT allocations. Uh, normally that's about 56,000 a year for us. And I'm sure it won't be this year. Um, but uh, despite all that, we, we couldn't just give up and shut things down. So we decided we were going to pivot from being a live entertainment and film venue into a credible live streaming venue as a way to replace some of that revenue. So we applied for and we were awarded a state KCAIC grant to purchase video equipment to get us started. And we intend to use uh, this multi-camera graphics uh, system to help us present live virtual concerts, stand-up comedy, uh, poetry readings, community discussions, plays, um, and all kinds of different things. Uh, it'll also serve as a vehicle uh, to allow nonprofits and corporations to rent the theater for me virtual meetings and fundraising uh, events. So we're pretty optimistic that we'll be able to present you know, six to 10 interesting and entertaining virtual events by the end of the year. Uh, we are being very conservative, our handling of the COVID-19 situation. You know, research is telling us uh, that audiences won't return until the pandemic is under control and they feel safe. Uh, so in response, we've uh, decided to produce these virtual events, but not be open to any public events for an indefinite period of time. Uh, we've developed guidelines and protocols for anyone entering the facility and we're providing sanitizing stations and a supply of masks and gloves, thermal temp scanner, uh, sign in, sign out sheets to allow contact tracing. And we're participating in Topeka Promise through the Greater Topeka Partnership. Uh, we expect all volunteers to adhere to wearing masks when others are nearby in the theater as they volunteer to do things inside the theater. And then we're gonna be sure to clean the facility you know, thoroughly. And our, uh, sometime before the end of the year, we plan to install contactless fixtures uh, to further reduce the spread of all germs. And um, you know, so we're, uh, we've got a, uh, I've got a, uh, A, a patron statement here I'm going to share. You can kind of look that over. Um, and um, are you seeing this uh, Jayhawk Theater patron statement? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So essentially, you know, it talks about our outline of what we're going to do, how we're going to make things happen. Uh, and that'll uh, evolve uh, over time. And um, we're uh, pretty serious about that. We, we take that all very seriously. We really want to uh, uh, make sure we um, uh, uh, make sure that uh, people who come into the, the theater are uh, safe and um, feel comfortable. So uh, with that, uh, you know, I, I want to also reiterate the fact that we are very interested in making sure that our uh, community emerges from this situation ready to hit the ground running. I'm sure the 
Evergy Plaza people feel the same way, as well as TPAC and TCT uh, and uh, Stormont Vale and everybody uh, is real eager to get through this and um, uh, emerge from it as a, a real powerful uh, uh, entertainment destination as a city. And with that, I'll take any uh, questions. Hi, uh, Christina Valdivia Alcala, District 2 representative. I just want to say I think that it's very uh, creative and uh, flexible, uh, the move that you've made to live streaming uh, events and purchasing, you know, receiving funds to purchase uh, the equipment. More and more on Facebook, what I am seeing, uh, you know, with art events in Texas and uh, California and Arizona and New Mexico, I'm seeing, you know, from poetry readings to documentary films, you know, everything is being live streamed and having watch parties and all of this. So I would be really interested to see how this works for you. Um, and definitely, you know, we know promotion is, is one of the, the most important parts. Uh, but I, I commend you for being able to pivot in that way because uh, these are definitely some trying times. So kudos. Thank you. Mike, any questions? No. Anything else? No questions. Anything else for you? Just a quick follow-up, I guess, and reiterate what uh, Councilwoman uh, Valdivia Alcala said. I think it it's, speaks well that you're uh, not standing still and you're looking at taking uh, the best opportunity you can during these times and to keep making the Jayhawk Theater um, an active part of the community. So my uh, compliments to you, Jeff. Thank you. Um, my only question is, um, uh, we, we've got all your quarterly reports. Thank you for getting those in on time. Can you just today, since you're here, just walk us through real quick where you've yeah. spent the TGT funds the last year or two? Yeah, uh, the large, uh, as, as any of uh, these projects will, will tell you, uh, the uh, process of the architecture of the uh, rebuilding of a, an old 1926 theater is pretty immense. And um, so uh, an architect, and in our case, it's trainer uh, uh, HL and uh, here in Topeka and Vance Kelly, uh, they have a, uh, about a two year to three year you know, uh, uh, timeline that they have established for us uh, to stay on track so that by the time our fundraising efforts have concluded, they're ready to, uh, you know, bid, bid out the, the work and, and uh, retain the contractors and get the, the work done. Uh, but there's a whole lot of steps leading up to that, as you all understand. And um, so what we've done is we've helped uh, pay uh, for those using uh, transit guest tax money as agreed. We've used uh, that money to help pay for the architectural work uh, along the way, and we're trying to stay on track with that. Uh, we're assuming that that amount won't be uh, the same going forward this year, so we're not quite sure how we're going to stay uh, on on track with that. Uh, uh, and we're doing our best to, you know, re uh, to work under a new um, uh, budgetary uh, situation with COVID and, and the lack of the events. So what we're using it for is architectural work. And um, uh, we have a $24,000 uh, installment that is due at the end of uh, 2020. And we're hoping to uh, get enough from the TGT fund to apply for, apply it to that uh, cost. And I'll just ask you, cause you're first, uh, I haven't, and we'll hear, we'll ask Jessica here in a little bit, but have you heard from the city what collect, what were uh, anything yay, nay, in terms of what you think the payment will be from 2020? 
No. Like I said, we'll talk to staff on what their estimation is, but I didn't know if there'd been any contact with you and I'll ask the others from the city yet. As well. No, no, okay. but I, I think any sane person would realize right. that it's not gonna be uh, what we were anticipating. Sure, okay. No, I was just curious if there'd been communication yet, so. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. I think that's all I had. Okay, I'll keep, I'll put on myself on mute. Thank you, guys. All right, Evergy. It's all you. Thank you. I'm going to pull this down sure. just a little bit. Um, I'm here kind of filling in. I'm usually here anyhow, but Vince had a conflict, so I'm going to try and bring you up to speed on everything that's happening at the Evergy Plaza. And I don't know how much, I was just looking at the last quarterly report that uh, Vince supplied in, in May, and there's been a lot transpired since then. Obviously, Spectra is on board uh, from a management standpoint, managing the operations and the events uh, that take place at, at the Plaza Forest as a foundation. Um, there has been, a, John Knight has been deeply entrenched in all things COVID with respect to what kind of events we can uh, produce on the plaza, what the, the restrictions will be. So we're very conscious of, of what we're going to be able to do there. And uh, I know he's in, in regular contact with Dusty Nichols in terms of uh, keeping tabs on what we can do there. The, the plaza, um, we still have one major component, one asset of the plaza that is not 100% operational yet, and that is due to the uh, current uh, restrictions. The water fountains, the crossroads fountain, is not uh, completely operational yet, and uh, we hope to have that up uh, just as soon as the restrictions are lifted to where international travel can take place again. The, uh, uh, we've got about three to four days worth of work left that can't be done until the restrictions are uh, lifted to where we can get those fountains up and, and operational. We do have the waterfall functioning. Uh, we shut it off yesterday to do some light maintenance to it, and we'll be turning it up again here as soon as I leave this meeting. Um, it, uh, the, you posed the question to, uh, to Jeff and I'll, I'll just hopefully get one step ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, transit guest tax money that we receive from this allocation is being used 100% to, uh, pay the debt service on the real estate. And I think you may have that from previous reports, but that's where it's been spent. That's where it will be continue to be spent um, at any point in the time in the future when that debt service is paid off, then that money will continue to go towards uh, operational and, and capital improvements. But that's that's a ways down the road. That'll that'll be a uh, somebody else besides me, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're, we're tickled to death to be uh, to the point we are. I wish we were complete with it and it was 100% um, ready to go. But there are things that we can do. You've seen a lot of activity on the video board. We've, uh, John and his sales staff have a slate of events that uh, people are uh, signing up for doing things on the plaza and getting contracts established with those. And it's a very careful process of evaluating everything that everybody wants to do on the plaza and make sure that we can do it within the current health restrictions. So um, we're excited. Um, just want to get this current situation behind us and in our rear view mirror so we can move forward. It's somewhat anticlimactic to build a, a uh, nearly a $10 million project and then have to, you know, you don't get to have a grand opening, you don't get to have a ribbon cutting, you don't. So um, it, it's been a, been a, 
uh, test of, of uh, patience here as we work through everything. But uh, I will just take any questions that you have. Uh, like I say, I kind of stepped into this about an hour ago, not knowing <laughs> what what uh, was coming. So sure, but it's just said, I no, no, you go, you go, you go. <laughs> um, I just have two questions. The, so the fountain issue is there's workers who can't get the job done. Not that it's not being turned on because of COVID right. concerns. We've got the manufacture of the equipment is man. It's manufactured in Canada. Gotcha. And the. Uh, the personnel that have to come in and do the commissioning of that and adjust all the pressure levels, load all of the software, uh, get everything done. They're basically IT people. And uh, we had them, I, I had them scheduled to be here uh, back on the 6th of April, I believe it was, before, and, and it was the week before that that everything kind of fell apart and the borders got closed. The current date, uh, on the border between Canada and the United States right now, it's July 21st. So it was supposed to be June 21st, and both governments agreed to extend it to the, to the uh, 21st of July. So assuming no changes take place after that, uh, it's my expectation that we'll have that work done as soon as possible thereafter. Um, the manufacturing firm has assured us i know they have multiple projects in the united states that they're involved in they have assured me that we are at the top of the list on when they can physically return to the united states so um it's just one of the hazards right. and then july 21st did may change again because we're, exactly. I tell everybody, I know, you know, the toughest thing about this is everybody wants a long-term answer. I say, folks, we're yes. week to week. Some weeks we're day to day, yeah. but we're, we're all week to week right now. My mother always said my weakest uh, gift was patience. Right. <laughs> and I, I have, uh, maybe in her eyes, maybe I've matured a little bit in the last six months. So, uh, My second question was just, can you, and I don't know this, can you talk about who's in charge of maintenance? of the plaza with all the different with your DTI Spectra is it somebody how that has worked out as you guys have worked this stuff through yes our contract with Spectra uh, they are 100% in charge of all of the maintenance ongoing maintenance routine maintenance uh, that includes the the flower beds that the planter all the plantings that have been done out there uh, so yes they are 100% uh, now the funding for that obviously comes well, from the it, right. from the foundation, but sure. we have a contract with them, both for operations and for ongoing maintenance. Okay. okay. I was curious. Any other questions? <laughs> um, I do. You said that Spectra. Do they also do uh, managing events? Mm -hmm. Yes. And that means planning the events. That planning the events. Uh, both from from a coordinating a coordination standpoint if somebody comes to to uh Spectre and says hey i'd like to do this event on the plaza they coordinate it they staff it they they manage it uh as well as they're also in the business of generating events on the plaza and we just had our our bi-weekly finance meeting earlier this morning and the list of things that is in front of us to take to take place on the plaza is pretty impressive now we've already lost a lot of things that we planned on having uh already but uh, it's as jeff has has experienced in his world at at uh, jayhawk it's hard to really plan anything too far in the in the future and you know, because things change so dramatically. So we've had things planned that we've had to back off of, and now we're back and, you know, we're still in the planning mode looking down the road, uh, but uh, recognize that we have to be flexible enough to change how we may do an event, how many people can be at that event. Uh, so. I was just thinking too that, um you know, for any cultural and artistic events that 
y'all may be planning once we've cleared from this uh, conundrum we're in with COVID that, you know, certainly uh, push for taking into account the diversity in the community yes. that we have, and especially if it's a place where we want children with their families to be, or children and youth mm -hmm. to be able to see themselves uh, reflected back from what either they yeah. see in a film or in a performance. Uh, is incredible, not only in the educational system, but also in the arts and culture as well. So. Absolutely, and I know that's, that's something we talk about all the time. Uh, I and mean, I'll just throw out a couple of things. Number one, the fountains, the Crossroad Fountains. Um, one of the things that's gonna be really neat is, is there is basically two modes to the fountains. There's a show mode where we have music that is programmed to interact with the water and the lighting, both the lighting within the fountains as well as the lighting in the plaza itself. So what we call show mode, that will be a huge draw. We're, uh, we've already gotten some, some national publicity out of that. The second mode is interactive, and that's where you as adults can go out and interact and, and, and actually be in the water. And then it, within that interactive mode, there's a toddler mode to where uh, the water will shoot up, I don't know, maybe 12 or 15 inches and the, and the youngsters can go out mm -hmm. and play in it. And we'll, we're actually gonna set it up to where maybe if the, if the fountains are on for four hours today in interactive mode, maybe the first hour of it is toddler mode and the remaining three hours is in an interactive mode where it becomes a, a splash pad. So, and then a lot of the events that they're working on, uh, you know, it's, that's diversity is one of our key target indexes there. So. That's great. Thank you. Anything else? Well, thank you for and shit and for Vance. We'll give them hell later. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Kurt. All right, thank you. Constitution Hall, you're on there, right? Grant, you're up, Grant. Okay, uh, I'm gonna yield to our, um, our, at this point, to our project manager, Chris Meinhart, who uh, we're really in the depth of uh, construction right now. And Chris, can you go from here? Thanks, Grant. <clears throat> yes, uh, I, I thought I'd give a quick review of, of uh, what we've achieved and where we are in construction. As Grant mentioned, we're in that phase. Uh, so we began the project with architectural and historical design work in late 2016 and followed this with state and federal review over a two year period this uh, critical work was arduous, including a lengthy period of delay in federal review due to the shutdown in 2019. Uh, Prepper day work began on site in the fall of 2019. Removal of the former facade occurred not until March of this year. This specialized work, including careful temporary shoring of the existing structure, required that we await scheduling by qualified contractors. Following the demolition phase, was excavation for concrete footings and foundations. These were poured in April of this year and recently in June, structural steel framing was installed. The facade wall has just been framed and sheathed in preparation for exterior installation of stone. Uh, just returning a bit to design reviews, during this phase that we determined that the first floor must be raised by approximately 10 inches to achieve authentic historical design of the original facade this required added planning, and we've worked closely with the project structural engineer to modify design and construction steps and get progress to achieve this. I've got a few photos. I don't know whether I can pull them up for us, but I'll try. Um, this, this first, um, well, that may be the best I can do. Uh, my skills are, are modest, but in the middle of this screen share, you'll see uh, a, a collage of what the uh, building looked like with its facade removed and what the plan is for its restoration. 
um, which we anticipate will be completed in, in early to mid to 2021. On the right, uh, if my arrow is working for us, is where we are today. This photo was taken last evening. I see. Okay. Uh, there you go. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, this is where we are today. This photo was taken last night, uh, showing the sheathing in progress. Um, and uh, I'm going to try to back up to um, a photo of what the building will look like when it's complete, but I'm probably not gonna be able to do that. So I would turn it over for questions and thank you, Grant. I would, I would, oh, I would add to the presentation, Chris, that uh, the Rotary Park, which we um, own and operate uh, in conjunction with the Topeka Downtown Rotary Club has remained open through uh, COVID and through this construction process. And that is, uh, still available for um, uh, guests to, uh, to see. Uh, I'm also uh, president of the um, trustees of the um, Freedom's Frontier National Heritage Area, of which Topeka and Jim Ogle is our executive director. Uh, Jim's staff has, has been developing a new application uh, for travel that links various uh, historic sites along certain themes and Freedom's Frontier has uh, the theme of pioneer progress and the cost to the American Indian nation communities um, as being one theme, the, the theme of the, the, the border war and the bleeding Kansas is the second theme and the enduring struggle for freedom in which our own Brown site is the, uh, one of the featured uh, sites, and this is a very much applicable today. So you can take with this new application uh, tours for the 41 counties in Kansas and Missouri that are linked to the Civil War era, the pre bleeding Kansas era, or you can, some sites are linked by their themes with freedom, uh, and such as the Underground Railroad. Uh, so we in, in, in Topeka, we're blessed to have over half a dozen uh, participating sites, and we're really excited about this um, application as we as we release that. And I just would say then that the, the, the even though we can't use the inside of our building while we're going through this process, that the story that we have to tell is very much available to the public in the adjacent uh, Freedom Park. And I'd ask open up for questions, probably primarily for Chris. <laughs> so what is the timeline of completion at this point for the facade? Uh, our, our current phase is, is, of, is, of course, completing the sheathing and repairing the roof, uh, the connection between the, from the roof to the new facade. Um, we, we have, uh, we're in the process of interviewing um, and bidding the stonework, the masonry. So uh, our, it's unclear when masons are going to be available. They're all very busy and scheduled for this year. So it may not be until late fall or early winter when the masonry can, can uh, be completed after the masonry or the windows. And so um, there uh, is work to be done on the interior flooring. So we're anticipating at the earliest uh, late spring of next year for completion. What is the total cost of this project? Uh, we're currently on budget and the uh, budget we established uh, by the, as, as so happens with the contract is around $355,000. Hmm. Okay. And then, uh, and this may be for Grant, can, as I've asked the others, can you just, again, we've gotten your reports. Thank you for timely submission to the city. Uh, can you just talk us through where you've spent the TGT funds uh, towards Constitution Hall? Uh, Grant, would you, would you like me to answer, answer well, that? 
Uh -huh. Yes, um, we, we've spent the, the construction, the, the funds entirely on construction, well, starting with architectural design as allowed by the contract, but we, we have spent all the funds on construction of the, of the facade as, as you've seen in the uh, views this morning. Great, looks good. It's looking good. Any questions, no. other council members? No. All right, well, if you have anything else to add, here's your chance. Otherwise, thank you very much. We appreciate you taking the time this morning. Thank you. With that, last one, Bruce Evil Knievel. Hello to the committee. Uh, thanks for having us in today. So I'm Bruce Zimmerman. I am the director of the Evil Knievel Museum. Hopefully you can hear me through my mask. It's yeah. one of the most difficult things for me <laughs> in fighting COVID in that when I, when I now, when I tell a joke, they have to be obvious and funny because <laughs> people can't see my facial expression and know I was trying to <laughs> attempt at humor. So our museum now has operated for, we're in our third season and uh, we were very much looking forward to uh, this season as we have uh, uh, acquired a couple of uh, major national awards our first two seasons. So we were looking for our numbers to really expand this year. And unfortunately, COVID has hurt us uh, drastically, uh, like it has hurt uh, all businesses uh, and attractions in, in our area, as out, actually out throughout the world, I'm sure. Uh, so we were actually closed uh, for two months uh, and that was very difficult for us. We were able to do, complete uh, some minor maintenance things that the uh, museum did need. Uh, so we did take advantage of, of excuse me, some of that time. <clears throat> um, so it, our attendance uh, so far, since we've been reopened, we've uh, had about half the uh, usual number of guests uh, through the museum so far this summer. Uh, we've continued uh, to have a strong attendance from folks from out of town. Uh, they, they tend to uh, be our, our largest uh, visitor, group of visitors, and uh, that's been good. Of course, we have uh, changed some of the way we do business with uh, extra cleaning, uh, disinfecting. We encourage the use of masks in our facility, and we certainly uh, practice social distancing. Uh, it's been interesting. We've had a lot of visitors from Kansas City uh, lately, and so I think maybe some of the heat of maybe uh, spending time in, in Kansas has been a good thing for us. So we haven't had as many uh, visitors from out of state, but there's been a lot of people from local areas come and discover us, so that's been very good. Um, we, we get a lot of phone calls, uh, more than we did in normal times, and it's people traveling down the road and they see our billboard and ask, they call and ask if we are open. And then one common question that they ask is whether, uh, what time we're gonna open the next day. And that makes us feel good because we know that people are uh, typically coming into Topeka, staying the night, uh, which is obvious our, our, the goal for all of us. Uh, to bring people to Topeka and let them uh, spend some money with us. Uh, and then they stay the night and uh, attend the museum first thing in the morning. Uh, so e even today, I received a call last Friday from a father and son, a duo, I'll call them, they're super fans, and they visited the museum about a year ago. They're from Chicago, and they were actually coming today. They plan on staying three days, and they brought a third friend with them this time. So. That's the kind of visitors we love to have. I'm not sure if I can entertain them for a full three days, but we'll sure, <laughs> we'll sure give it a try. Sell them a bike. You know. <laughs> there you go, that's right. You know, originally we thought that uh, most of our attendance would be made up of uh, motorcycle riders, uh, since Evil Knievel uh, uh, did his stunts on uh, motorcycles, of course. Uh, but what's turned out, we, that's about 10% of our visitors, and we have a lot of families uh, that visit. Uh, so it, it's been kind of fun to share the history of Evil Knievel and along with that some of the history of the, the, our country in the 1970s because that's when uh, he was doing most of his performing. So that's been fun. Now we have been hurt in attendance additionally uh, with not having any group evening uh, events and that's been something that's been of great support to the museum where folks would come and have dinner uh, and then tour our museum. 
And we have also missed um, something that we didn't account, on, account for in the beginning as well. We've, we've uh, the second year we had a number uh, of school groups come and visit yeah. us. Uh, so they would come to the museum. Uh, we would uh, sh uh, introduce them to Evil Knievel and then even have some um, uh, lessons on bones, believe it or not, because Evil Knievel was hard on his bones. <laughs> Uh, so we would incorporate that lesson for the youngsters. Uh, we had a number of school groups come and have lunch with us, uh, tour the museum, and then participate in those lessons. And unfortunately, that hasn't been possible. So um, I, I would address the question that where uh, our TGT money is spent. We've actually spent all of our money uh, already. Uh, it may have been mentioned before uh, when the president of our uh, a board of directors has spoke that uh, we borrowed money from a local bank, uh, spent that on our uh, virtual reality motorcycle jump, uh, the interactive that allows our visitors to uh, complete a motorcycle jump like Evil Knievel, and that was filmed in downtown Topeka. And uh, unfortunately, uh, so we had spent that money, we borrowed the money from a local bank, and as the funds <coughs> come available to us, we pay on that debt. Uh, unfortunately, we have not been able to run the jump uh, since we've reopened after COVID. There is a lot of personal contact between a jump operator uh, and our visitor. Uh, the other way that COVID's kind of impacted us, we've lost a number of our uh, volunteers as they felt that it was not worth the risk for some of the older folks to come in and uh, volunteer and help us. So there's been some added expense of paid employees to be there to make sure that our visitors do have a a good experience in the museum. All right, I think that's what I have. If anyone has any questions? So did you guys attempt or think you qualify or decide not something like a PPP loan or was that anything considered or? Um, I, you know, I, I do know uh, that there was uh, uh, some talk of that, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure that that, yeah. Sure. was was pursued heavily yeah. yeah it's a very good question thank you um you, you you mentioned i guess maybe if there's silver linings in some of this you mentioned you had a uptick from the kansas city area mm -hmm. which i hope is a positive because then those people may go back to that area and tell people how great it was yes i will say i'm, I'm actually on vacation this week so i have four meetings today my wife said i'm not doing vacation right <laughs> but originally we were supposed to go to a family reunion uh, last week and this week, and so obviously with COVID, that that opened in Michigan and Wisconsin, that's not happening. But we also said, well, we still have a six-year-old who's going stir crazy, and so we actually went last week to the Salina Zoo, Rolling Hills, and out to the Sedgwick County Zoo. Now I have been to Wichita, can't tell you how many times in my life, and Salina, I can't tell you how many, and I've never been to those locations. And so this sort of gave us an alternative to say, finally, we can. That's a trip we can make. Social distancing. It's outside. It was great. And so now I tell you, those were great zoos, and I can go. And so I hope there's the same sort of, if there's a silver lining, you get some regional folks who are now looking for things that are safe like that and come to Topeka and say, well, we can go to the Evil Knievel. That's a safe thing to do. And Yes, so you're right. There's, uh, it may be the perfect opportunity to, to glean yeah, some so local it's visitors. It's a small sure. lining, but yes. at least it's something Better than nothing, that's right. <laughs> so here's hoping. <laughs> Any other questions? Good. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Thank you. I believe we caught everybody. Was there anyone else here that I'm unaware of that gets TGT money that wanted to speak to the cause? Um, I want to thank everybody for doing that. That helps us immensely. Like I said, I, I think as a general rule, we believe it's essential to keep checking in with you folks for a variety of reasons. A, to see that you're spending the money as we intended, but also to see where we can help you and promote you and, and push your efforts forward to, to get what we're all trying to accomplish. And so. If there's anything you folks need at any time, please just ask and, and let us know. Now, I want to say something, and I'm going to caveat it, so don't freak out. Anyone who gets money, please. Um, you all are going to get all your money all in the same time frame. Having said that, I may come to you in the next few months and try to have a conversation with each and every one of you about some ways we may or may not want to restructure some of your contracts. Uh, and for some of you, this applies. For some of you, doesn't. I've had some talks with staff and city manager about this. Yours were done a little differently than they had previously been done. And there is a way to ensure that you still get all of your money in the same amount of time, but that also allows us as a city to free up some additional dollars into the program. And so I want to caveat that with nobody's going to take your money. You're all good. You're all safe. 
But if I come have that conversation, just be ready to talk to me and be open to the conversation. And if it doesn't work for you, we will not, I will not be offended. Um, but we're all, especially through these times, looking for creative ways to make sure that everybody gets what they're promised um, and that we can also, as a city, fix some clerical things that maybe we can correct a few years in. So I just wanted to throw that out there. And if you have questions about that later, feel free to talk to me. But I did want to make sure if you hear that rumbling, Duncan's going to come talk to you about your contract. It's not about taking anything away from you. I just want, I just want to put that out there for the, for the cause. Um, before we move on, was there any comments or in general anyone to make about the presentations? All right, with that, We'll look at the fund budget review. Who gets that responsibility? Is that Jessica or somebody else? Um, this is Jessica. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, last week we, well, previously we had provided the 2021 budget, and then last week we provided it again with um, the memo. And as you kind of covered, the TGTA uh, budget is really just an allocation of previously determined contract agreements. Um, so that's what you're seeing on the expense side. And then on the revenue side, um, there was a question in terms of communication to the uh, approved entities in terms of 2020 and beyond uh, expectations. We don't, we do not have any uh, unique information regarding revenue projections at this time. Uh, the publicly available information that I've found from the state is that May and April, I think we received about 30% um, compared to the prior year for those same months. Uh, so it, I think in terms of 2020, you know, we're, we're kind of going along for the ride as well, trying to figure out uh, what um, additional guidance we can give out, but I think it also depends on, you know, where the overall COVID health emergency um, goes from here. Okay, Jessica, real quick, sorry to interrupt you. So, so let me ask you a question in that vein. Will there be a time, say the end of July, and where there can be a best guess estimation that at this point in time, we believe that the bare minimum we're going to be able to get you is, I'm going to make up a number, okay, $30,000. Um, we don't know about the rest until then. Um, some sort of some sort of estimation, as inaccurate as it might be. <laughs> well, I mean, we can go off the current information that we have, which is 30% of last year. Okay. Um, but the, the quite reason frankly... Sorry. Sorry. No, that was my fault. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, you know, if if the COVID health emergency in the Topeka area were to get worse, you would have to expect, I think, to see revenues go down in that line as well. Um, but we don't guarantee any amount being paid to the individual entities because it's a pass through. Right. Right. Okay. I just didn't know if there's if there is a way in early August to at least communicate with the groups that kind of what you just said. Hey, as of today, it looks like 30%, but it could get worse, people. <laughs> it lets them do some sort of internal worst-case scenario planning, um, you know, of, of some baseline. So it wouldn't be a promise. So if that's something we could at least look at and consider just to communicate sort of a, here's what we know today to them, to give them an ability to start planning. I mean, I think as Jeff Carson said, they know it's going to be maybe not as good, but be nice to give them some baseline to start working off of if, if that's possible in another 30 days or so. So that's all. That's where I was headed with that. Okay. Will do. Plus then there's uh, no surprises like, wait, we thought you were going to give us this much. We can say, no, 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 no. We told you it was well, going mean, bad. Yeah. <laughs> there, I mean, there still could be surprises, right? Like we don't, um, right. the city doesn't receive any uh, unique information, at least that I'm aware of, um, that forecasts uh, right. the, the TGT money. Um, so that's, you know, that's also kind of where we're a little hesitant to provide um, specific numbers because, you know, we, we don't guarantee a pass through. We, sure. we do pass through the, the revenue we receive, but we can, um, gotcha. we can work on providing some additional feedback in terms of what we are seeing, um, if that's helpful, but we can work on that. No, I understand. Thank you very much on that. Uh-huh. Um, so really, the, this budget is more of a... Um, a, a projection. It's based off of the predetermined funding allocation. Um, we the the revenue I believe was taken down five percent off of 2019. Um, you know, quite frankly, it's a shot in the dark. We're just you know we're trying our best. 
to give some indication that the overall economic um, you know, growth potential is probably um, quite a bit less than what we would be projecting for 21, absent the COVID health emergency. Um, and so for entities that are receiving this funding, um, I think it's really important just to remember, again, that it's a pass-through. Um, and then as we get information, we will definitely pass that along. Well, explain to me what the contingency line is, what those dollars are, and where they end up. Sure. That, that is just the, the fund balance. And certain um, agreements were built up, um, I believe, some of that is Sunflower, and I believe by the end of 2020, that will come down. It's a reflection of money coming in and being used for debt service, and there's a, a relationship between the city, I believe, and the county based off the special assessments. Okay. And I think, I take it the admin fees are, are what, those, those what? dollars go back to the city for administering the... Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, just clarifying, yep. Yep. Making sure I actually knew what I thought I knew, right? How's that work? <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's all in the contract agreements. Uh, any additional questions, committee members, about this budget? Mm -hmm. No. All right, so with that, we need to either, are there any amendments, changes, suggested alterations to this here budget in front of you? Not for me. I have none. I have none. All right. Uh, with that, I would uh, uh, ask for a motion to approve. So move, motion to approve. I will second that. Uh, all those in favor of approving this for the 2021 budget, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay, great. No opposition. All right, with that, we have passed this budget. It can now be folded into the into the 2021. and. Uh, I have I have only one other item, um, but I guess before I get to that, is there anything else anyone else would like to add? Anyone in the crowd, anyone would like to add, say to us, to us at us at this time? Anyone up here sitting at this table? <laughs> All right, I would like to schedule another meeting for the end of August after we've gone through the other budget process. Um, it won't be too full of a meeting, probably fairly short, but just to go over some stuff that we'd like to accomplish before the end of the year or looking into 2021. And then if anything else comes out of the uh, larger budget that we think we need to address, it'll give us an opportunity to do that then. Um, so my goal would be, I don't, you know, last week of August, first week of September. Um, like I said, I don't want to do it before we've got the, bud the, the larger budget done. September. We've got that fun month ahead of us, so. So maybe first part of September. That'd be fine, yep be that first week I would oh. just like the only thing I would have is not to have it on a Tuesday if we can help no it. that's fine yeah I understand you want to load your day with meeting okay. I mean what um, I mean uh, what about August 31st a Monday is that terrible for staff horrible am I not knowing something We're still on furloughs then probably okay I wasn't sure uh, so would that work August 31st? For me, it would. Does staff yeah. have any issues? Yeah, I'm good with the 31st. Okay, then let's do August 31st. Same time, same place. And then Mr. Pavarnik, are you there? Yes, thank you very much. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. He uh, just like very quickly, I don't, and I don't want to repeat myself. Councilman Duncan, did. Um, has anybody given an update on the new president of Visit Topeka? Because I thought I would do that real quick. No, they have not. To. That's probably a good idea. Okay, great. So uh, several people that I see in that room were actually on the search committee and involved, uh, but just wanted to give a quick update that Sean Dixon uh, will be starting on July 20th. So that's two weeks from yesterday. And uh, Sean comes to us from Springfield, Missouri, uh, where he has worked for Visit Springfield for the last 10 years. Uh, the search committee uh, went through a very laborious process and then several uh, people also met with Sean that weren't on the search committee. Uh, but the search committee was eight, eight people strong and it was a unanimous decision to extend the offer to Sean and bring him in. And so we're really looking forward uh, to having that role filled 
and uh, just wanted to give you that. So we're, we're about 13 days away from having the president of Visit Speak on board, and I'm sure he'll look forward to participating in that August uh, meeting. And if you'd like to put him on the agenda, he'd be happy to do that. Thank you for letting me give that report. Great. Thank you very much. With that, anything else for the good of the body? And we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.